thank you all so much for being here. And thank you, of course, to Mr. Lapid. Um, uh, as you all may know, um, Mr. Lapid is the head of the Yesh Atid party in Israel. Um, and as of now, a, the Israeli opposition leader. And if I'm not mistaken, this is actually his first live English interview as the official Israeli opposition leader. Um, and welcome to our conversation, which is unofficially titled, uh, entitled Two Yair's Three Opinions. Um, so I want to get going very quickly because I know that all of you have already started submitting your questions and the sooner we get going, the sooner we can get to some of those. Um, and just a reminder to those who came in a little later, there's a Q&A button on the bottom and you can submit your questions as we have our conversation. Um, all right, so let's talk a little bit about um, the ideology of you and your party um, and the sorts of uh, values that you've represented in the Israeli public discourse. Um, you have spent years making a pretty muscular case for a form of political centrism uh, and moderation in Israel. Uh, and many thought that your party, Yesh Atid, was just a flash in the pan that would subside like so many other third-way Israeli parties, including your own father's. I actually recall a very prestigious American publication uh, whose editor in 2013 wrote a very long cover story about the future of Israeli politics. And the whole thing was about Naftali Bennett, the settler leader, who ended up getting 12 seats in that election to your 19, and who today has just four while you have 16. So after all that, here you are six elections later leading the opposition. Why is that? And what do you think outside observers miss about what you're doing? Well, I guess they missed two things. One is the fact that we are part of a, a strong and a very interesting international movement who includes, for example, uh, Emmanuel Macron's and Marche in uh, France and uh, Rota's uh, movement in the, 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 the Dutch prime minister in the Netherlands. And so there is, there is the, the, the centrist uh, has become, I mean, you know, there's only one real rule in politics, which is the pendable, pendulum principle. And the centrism was the answer, or, and still is the answer, to the rise of populism. Somebody needed to give an answer to the rise of populism from the left and from the right. With moderate ideas, with, with uh, an understanding of the complexities of real, the real lives of real people. And uh, so we, we, we didn't came, it wasn't an Israeli phenomena, uh, uh, but, but a, a global phenomena and an interesting one and that is lasting all over the world. So this is number one. Number two is you are right and I, I appreciate you saying that there is something that the, the ideas were solid. And the idea of centrism is the ability uh, not to spread um, the main reasons or, 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 or main reasoning of our lives, but to try to connect them. I'll give you an example. If Israel, Israel is a Jewish democratic uh, state, so it seems like the Israeli right is leaning towards the Jewish part and the Israeli left is leaning towards the democratic part. What we are saying is that our duty uh, uh, is to, to make those live together. If we are a liberal national uh, movement, it means we understand nationalism doesn't contradict liberal ideas, but support liberal ideas. The liberal ideas are the core uh, in which our uh, 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 nationalism is that, that, that our nationalism is surrounding. So what we're trying to do is to form a movement that tell people you need to be uh, uh, being an extremist is not authentic. Understanding what life is really about is authentic, and life usually happens in the center because this is where the middle class lives. This is where sane, moderate people live. This is where the majority is. And, and um, funny enough, the majority didn't have a voice until we appeared. I still remember uh, um, people from the Israeli left going on, on Knesset podiums and telling us all that uh, 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 Yeshatid and myself, we are all just a trend and we will disappear soon the same way it was written in 2013, all these people are not in politics anymore, and here we are still live and kicking. And I, I think 
telling the world that we need less theories and more politicians who are capable of, of uh, uh, working for them and understanding a country as more as a managed conflict and less as a battle between two sides that wants to kill each other. Yeah, so moving, you know, moving exactly in that direction, the next thing I want to talk to you about was uh, another thing that I noticed as someone who's covered Israeli politics that makes Yesh Atid stand out is uh, inclusivity. Like you watch your ads in Hebrew, uh, and they almost always mention various groups that are often left out of the Israeli conversation. Uh, I'm reminded particularly of an arresting line from one of your speeches that was turned into a big ad where you said, you can't proclaim from morning until evening how much you love the country when you hate most of the people who live in it. Um, and that resonated with me because it doesn't just describe Israeli politics and the sort of dynamics you see there. It could easily describe our own here and some in other countries as well. Um, and in that speech, uh, to contrast what you were trying to do, you said, um, you named some of the groups um, that you would stand up for that often bear the brunt of this sort of hatred uh, within society, uh, from the LGBT community to the Arab community, uh, to reform and conservative Jews. So I just wanted to hone in on a couple of those communities. Um, to begin with, most Israelis don't have a personal experience with non-Orthodox Judaism. Um, your father was an outspoken secularist, and in that he represents a lot of uh, uh, non Orthodox Jewish Israelis' relationship to religion. Uh, but you've been an outspoken advocate for non Orthodox Judaism in the Israeli public sphere. You just uh, made a statement to this effect recently in Israeli politics. Uh, and those who look at the headlines will see that. Um, can you explain how your personal relationship with non Orthodox Judaism came to be, especially since most Israelis very understandably don't know so much about it because it's not so much an Israeli phenomenon? Well, it, it is, it's, it's formed uh, uh, by meeting uh, uh, people from diaspora, by being, you know what, by being curious. There's something to me, one of the things that are, are uh, 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 sometimes depressing is the lack of curiosity within the Israeli society or between Israeli, uh, especially Israeli youth, to their brothers and sisters uh, uh, abroad. And um, to me, it was always, uh, maybe because I'm a son of, 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 of an immigrant who, who was raised in Europe. My grandparents in Budapest used to go to the neological uh, synagogue in, in uh, Budapest, the Duany, which is uh, probably an early version of a conservative uh, uh, synagogue. So, so it was intriguing to me. Um, and and uh, it led to an intense and long uh, dialogue between myself and, and uh, American leaders like Rick Jacobs uh, uh, from the reform movement and, and the people from the conservative movement and others, uh, Rabbi Cosgrove uh, from Park Avenue Synagogue, who's, who's who I'm proud to call a friend. So uh, it, like everything else in life, it is a part of, of a dialogue of an ongoing dialogue. I, I really think that what we, you know, and, and um, when, when you are sometimes the sole voice who protect uh, these streams of Judaism, then they tend to talk to you and then you get to know them better. I've said many times, and it's an opportunity to say it again, uh, it, I, I, I refuse uh, uh, to, 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 bow to the fact that Israel has become the only Western democracy in which Jews do not have freedom of religion. Uh, only today, the mayor of Jerusalem said that reformed Jews will not be uh, uh, allowed to, um, to pray in the Wailing Wall, in the, in the Kotel. And I've said, and I, I react in response saying, the times in which Jews were not allowed to pray wherever they want, are gone and, uh, and good riddance. So uh, the answer is I was curious. I, 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 fortunately enough, they were uh, um, curious about the fact that I'm curious about them and therefore evolved a, a dialogue that was interesting and enriching uh, uh, um, for, for, for both sides. And so 
then moving into the Israeli domestic uh, sphere, one of the paradigm shifts that became evident this past election year or so in Israel was the increasing electoral participation of Arab voters and the subsequent willingness of the predominantly Arab joint list to coordinate and even cooperate with the Israeli opposition to Netanyahu. Uh, there's even a case to be made that if not for two right-wing holdouts within Benny Gantz's faction, he might have formed a minority government in coordination with the joint list. Um, now, despite your own strongly expressed differences with members of the joint list slate, you've also appeared alongside the party's leader, Ayman Ode, at rallies for Israeli democracy. Um, and as more Israeli Arabs vote and tell their leaders that they want their representatives to work with rather than boycott the Zionist Jewish parties, where do you see this heading in the years ahead? Is there a future for Jewish Arab cooperation in Israeli politics and what does it look like? I think two quick thoughts. One is because of the coronavirus, uh, the COVID-19, uh, uh, all of a sudden the Israelis, have no the Israelis have noticed the fact that so many of our doctors and nurses working in our hospitals, taking care of our elderly are Arabs, Israeli Arabs. And this is kind, I mean, all of a sudden, it, you know, it's interesting because you can always tell the difference. What's the first thing that differentiate uh, uh, young Jews from young Arabs in, uh, in Israel? They don't go to the army and we do. And all of a sudden there was in this new huge battleground and everybody was fighting shoulder to shoulder. And this, this, this meant a lot to a lot of people. So this is in terms of, of uh, um, the kind of, of, of atmosphere that does, uh, is now uh, going in the country. There are two uh, by now famous um, Arab doctors who are running uh, hospitals in, here in Israel. So, so you get to hear those voices um, uh, of people speaking on day-to-day -day or almost day-to-day -day issues uh, and you're saying, okay, all of a sudden I like the accent. All of a sudden I, 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 I feel uh, um, uh, a new form of, of comrades uh, uh, being, being, being uh, uh, created. So this is number one. Number two is, again, when you get to know people, then you get to, you know, then you are able to differentiate. Once we have started the dialogue with the join list, it was more obvious. I mean, we knew it. The ones, the, those of us who are in politics knew it uh, uh, in advance. But it was, it became obvious to a lot of Israeli, to the, lot, to the majority of Israelis, that the Arabs in this country, 20% of these of the Israeli citizens, are not formed the same way. You know what? Same way the Jews are not. I mean, yes, there are within the supporters and even some of the Knesset members of the joint list, of the joint Arab list, people who are supporting terror. And these are the people you don't want to be in dialogue with and you, you cannot accept the fact that they have been saying publicly that they support Hezbollah and Hamas. Uh, but you also have within the Israeli extreme right people who support terror and you cannot accept this either. And it doesn't mean the entire Israeli right is supporting terror. And it doesn't mean you cannot speak with the entire Israeli right, or even the, I don't want to say the extreme right, but the people who are hard uh, uh, um, hardliners of the Israeli right. You can be a hardliner and still a decent person. As, and, and the same way you can be part of the, the joint list and a Knesset member of the joint list who's not supporting terror, but has views you disagree with. And, and, and again, I guess my and my party's centrism uh, becomes handy because we are saying we are all about this ability to measure the word for what it really is and discuss with people and understand the real motives instead of labeling them and saying, okay, all Arabs are uh, 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 terror supporters and therefore we cannot speak with them. No, there are 20% of the Israeli citizens and therefore they are also uh, um, a complicated, interesting, uh, important to talk to group of Israelis. And uh, of course we support uh, equal rights for everybody regardless their religion 
or ethnic uh, uh, origins. So yes, I think there is a more, an interesting future to these relations also on the political arena. Um, so now going to the political arena, some of the questions that are probably on many people's minds, um, given current politics, as we all know, the reason you are in the position you are in now as the opposition leader is that you split with your one-time partner and ally, Benny Gantz, when he made the last minute decision to join a unity government with Benjamin Netanyahu. Um, Gantz argued that the move was necessary to safeguard Israeli democracy uh, by ensuring that uh, the rule of hell of law would be upheld and that is to say basically Netanyahu would go on trial. Um, and also that there was credible stable governance during the coronavirus uh, virus crisis. Now, you obviously disagreed very strongly with his decision and his justifications and have been sharply critical of both. Uh, so can you tell us a little bit more about why you decided that the right place for you right now was outside the government rather than in it? Because principles are not circumstantial. I, I mean, Gans gave an interview a couple of days ago and, and uh, somebody asked him, said, you said that by principle, you will never uh, serve under a prime minister with three indictments just because it's immoral, unethical, and against your, not only best, best judgment, but also your, the core of your principles. And he said, yes, I said it was a principle, but it was a principle that was only good for that time. Principles by definition are not timed. They are eternal. And, 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 um, and I strongly feel, as you've said, I strongly feel that uh, if you promise to the public that you are not willing to sit, serve under a prime minister with three indictments, and, uh, uh, then, and then you cannot claim that, uh, by the way, and you knew in advance that he's, he has, he's, he's indicted and he's going to trial, then you cannot claim something has changed. Nothing has changed. Maybe it's not as easy as you thought it will be. Maybe there are obstacles. Maybe there are difficulties. But when you use the term uh, 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 being able to hold under pressure, this is the moment the term was, was uh, 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 structured for. Yes, there was a huge pressure. And people felt that uh, we didn't do as well as we, we, we thought we will. And people felt that uh, they don't know what will happen. Um, but what you do in circumstances like this is just hold your own and you just go back to your core values and you look into your, your own heart and you try to figure out how to be able to live with yourself afterwards. I'm not naive. I'm an experienced ex politician by now. I know that politics is the art of the possible, but you have to have some to have some red lines. And the red line here was we have formed the party, the the Kholavan the party, with Benny Gan saying we need to bring change to the country. And then to crawl under Netanyahu, who's been there for 14 years now. Is, has nothing to do with change and hope and the kind of uh, the wind of change we wanted to bring into to, to work to, to, to this to, to the country and uh, what I've said to myself well my values are the same values I always I, I was telling the people about and therefore I'm going to continue to fight the good fight with with uh, uh, my partners and I can only be very uh, Sorry is a small word, heartbroken from the fact that the people I've marched with for, marched with for more than a year has collapsed under depression. So you referenced um, Netanyahu's uh, impending trial under several indictments for corruption, fraud, and breach of trust. Um, for those unaware, so Netanyahu will be going on trial on Sunday. Um, so what do you think is at stake for Israel in that trial? Well, first and foremost, it's, it's an ethical and moral blow to the heart of the nation. You know, it's, it's interesting. Uh, the only reason 
there is nothing written in our laws against the idea that somebody with three indictments, criminal indictments, will be still serving uh, as, a, as, a, as a prime minister is because the founding fathers couldn't even imagine somebody with three indictments will not resign and will say, no, I'm, I'm, I'm staying here and I'm gonna be, do both. I'm gonna be in the morning in my trial and in the afternoon in the security cabinet ordering, I don't know, an attack on Syria. So I, it's, and, and the one thing, one horrible thing we, in the world, the new world that we'll be living in we are living in is the fact that people are getting used to everything. Everything that used to be crazy and unheard of and, and scandalous. Uh, you know, you just, you know, another day passes, another day passes and, and, um, and you get used to it. And uh, when first time we've been, we say, I said on television to, 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 I don't know, to somebody who was interviewing me, we cannot have a prime minister with three indictments. He said, yes, this is horrific. This is shocking. It will never happen. The last time I, I, I said this to somebody who was interviewing me, his eyes glazed and he, he wanted to speak about something else because he've heard it so many times. Now I know that, that it is very complicated to, ex to explain to Americans these days that there is a possibility that politics will become crazy but here in Israel, some, it, it happened so, and we are, we are trying to, to figure out ways to uh, uh, protect what it is that we are against something that is so deeply uh, uh, unethical, to say the least. Um, so speaking of what Netanyahu will be doing in the evenings when he's not on trial, uh, according to the current coalition agreement, uh, the only two things that the current government is allowed to freely legislate on is the coronavirus response and the potential annexation of the West Bank in whole or in part. Um, there has been much speculation whether Trump will greenlight such a move uh, and whether Netanyahu, who has had over a decade in power to do something like this and never attempted it, um, and in fact, quashed it in the past, whether he'll actually go through with it. So I would ask you, having spent some time with Netanyahu over the years, do you think he means it this time? And what is uh, Yeshatid's position on annexation? Well, I will start with, this, with the latter. Uh, we are against anything that is unilateral. That is not to say that I don't feel or think that uh, the Jordan Valley is Israel and will be Israel in any future that I can uh, predict or imagine and in any uh, uh, future uh, agreement with the Palestinians. Having said that, this, I, and you know what? And, and the Jordan Valley is now part of Israel. It's not like somebody threatening it to take it, threatening us to take it away from us. So having said that, anything that is unilateral endangers our peace treaty with Jordan, our uh, uh, security coordination with uh, uh, the Palestinian Authority, our relations with uh, the, the Democratic Party in the US that thinks, looks at this as uh, uh, something that puts in peril um, the principle of one person, one vote, and our relations with uh, uh, the European Union. So to, to take all these risks for a move that will physically will change nothing, but internationally, in terms of our uh, international position, might endanger the country in so many ways, it's just not smart. So we're going to vote against it. Yeshatin is going to vote against it. Uh, because, say, uh, but after emphasizing the fact that uh, uh, the, we, we support the idea that the Jordan Valley is and always will be the security, the, the eastern security border of Israel. The problem uh, is that you know the fact the fact that Netanyahu's trial 
is threatening his legitimacy as the prime minister is causing is, 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 is making it very important to him to gather around him the Israeli right. And the easiest way to do so is to annex the Jordan Valley. So I am uh, um, I, I afraid that there is a strong possibility they will go on with this uh, risky, unnecessary move. Okay. Now I'm starting to already glance at some of the questions that people are uh, putting in for us. Um, and uh, one of the things uh, that people um, are ask about a lot, obviously, um, from an American perspective, and not just from an American perspective, is the outlook of Israel towards diaspora Jews. Um, because this has, of course, been a long running uh, discussion, debate, conversation. Um, within Israel where half of the world's Jews, probably soon more than half of the world's Jews live, uh, but many other Jewish communities around the world, how, how does Israel relate to them? Do they think all Jews belong in Israel or Jews should be all over the world? Um, and you hear different voices in the Israeli conversation, especially in the current government, uh, which likes certain uh, Israeli Jews, but very often uh, non-Israeli Jews, but very often seems to only like the ones that agree with them politically. Um, and I'm curious how you um, envision Israel's relationship um, with Jews outside of Israel. Well, in ways it's a generational thing, meaning young Israelis do not know many young American Jews or, or many young Jews in the diaspora. The way my generation, of course, my, my parents' generation, uh, uh, knew uh, Jews in the diaspora. Israel was a country in which up until, I don't know, 25 years ago, the majority of Jews came from somewhere with, with, and, and, and they were holding the two cultures in the same hat. This is not what is happening right now in Israel. These, the young Israelis are just Israelis. They've met maybe uh, uh, a bus of, of, of uh, young people who came uh, in a birthright tour uh, when they were in the army, but this is about it, and this is not enough. And our challenge is to make sure that the next generations of young Jews will meet each other and talk to each other and have a constant dialogue with each other. And I think this is uh, um, a joint duty, but more so the duty of Israel to, to make sure that the young Israelis understand the diaspora, the importance of the diaspora, the culture of the diaspora. Um, I, I'll give you a quick example uh, uh, that for my generation is, is almost weird. The fact that uh, uh, young Israelis don't even understand they know it maybe intellectually, but they don't understand emotionally what it is to live surrounded by non-Jews. Just, you know, to be, I don't know, a Jew in Montana, a Jew in upstate New York, a Jew in California, whom 90% of the people you meet are not Jewish. And how does this affect your worldview? How does this affect your relations with your Judaism? This is something that has become strange to the majority of Israeli. On top of this, there is, and you, 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 you were accurate about this, there is the influence of uh, um, the fact that our government has uh, uh, adopted and accepted a version, a very specific version of Judaism, which is the Israeli verse, version of being an Orthodox. It's not even American version of being an Orthodox. Uh, now, you've said earlier that the majority of Israelis or some of the Israelis are secular. I will, I will disagree. The majority of Israelis, I mean, being a secular, I'm a secular Jew, and being a secular Jew is an ideology. The majority of Israelis are just non-religious. There is a huge difference between being secular and being non-religious. Um, and when you're non-religious, you don't really care what kind of version is uh, uh, taking control by the people who, whom it is 
it is relevant for their lives. So, and, and this indifference can only be dealt with education and dialogue and, uh, and the ability of, I don't want to say their government, but a government to tell the, the Israelis, this is important to us. We need to have an immediate and close relations with the diaspora because this is existential to uh, and and this is this is important both in terms of ideology and you know what even in terms of of uh, 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 national security because of the influence that the, the uh, uh, American jury have on uh, the 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 the, 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 administra the American administration so I don't think we are in a great spot I don't see, think this is this is hopeless I think there's a lot of work to be done. Uh, I'm not really encouraged by the fact that the new minister of the diaspora, there's something like that called the minister of the diaspora in the government, is uh, an uh, uh, orthodox uh, woman. She's, she's an orthodox Jew. Hopefully, she'll be more tolerant and pluralistic than uh, her, the former um, uh, ministers. Um, so to take a big step back as we wrap up here. Um, it's, there's Israeli politics and then there's what's going on in the world right now, which is kind of inescapable. It's why we're having this conversation by video um, over an ocean. And uh, it's a difficult, if a difficult time for a lot of people, whether they're in Israel or they're in America. Um, many of them are stuck at home, out of work, can't see their families. And many are sick or know someone who is. Um, and now Israel has weathered this significantly better uh, than uh, the United States as of now. Um, I was wondering if there's anything you could share about uh, how Israel, how yourself, uh, cope with what we've been dealing with uh, uh, that might be of use to our people back home here in the United States. Mm, that's a great question. Uh, can I, well, can I tell you one quick, I don't know if it's that quick, old Jewish joke? Of course. There's an old Jewish joke about a father from Florida calling his, an elderly father from Florida calling his son in New York and said, listen, uh, your mom and I has decided to get a divorce. And the son said, what are you crazy? You've been married for 60 years. You think it's now it's the time to get a divorce? And the father said, yeah, well, you know what? We never got, got along really good. And, and we, we stayed together for your kids, but you're not grown ups, and you have your own lives. And, and it's I, I don't want to spend the, my last years uh, uh, fighting all the time. So we're getting a divorce and it's consent and it's, it's okay. Uh, and, uh, and the son says, wait, 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 dad. I'm, going, I'm getting my sister on the phone from California and she gets on the phone from California. And he said, listen, you two, dad, mom, don't do anything hasty. Stay home, we are coming over. And let's talk about this as a family. So the father says, you know what? Okay, I don't mind, but I'm telling you, we made up our mind. He said, yeah, but wait there. Give us a few days, we're coming over. So he says, sure, why not? He closes the phone, turns to his wife and says, they're coming over for Passover. So I think what happened with the coronavirus, everybody came over for Passover. I saw my children more than I used to because they're grown ups and now, but you know, in times of trouble, this unbelievable institution of the Jewish family has emerged with all its glory. And, uh, and, and we have more dialogue. Sometimes it was with, with, uh, in, 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 with Zoom, like the, the one we're having right now. And my mother who's 85 years old, kept on pushing the button and said, why am I mute? And everybody shouts, you're not in mute, we can hear you. And it all looks like a Jackie Mason uh, um, sketch. And yet uh, the one advice I have is the oldest advice you can give, which is remember this as an example to the fact that nothing is important like family and nothing is as strong as the Jewish family. That's the only, I, I sounded, 85 myself, but this is the only conclusion I, ha I took from, from this time. All right. Um, thank you, Mr. Lapid. We appreciate your time. Um, you. And we look forward to continuing the conversation as the years go on. Please, we'll, please do. Thank you so much.